Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. This session, we're going to look into the book of Romans and see what it has to say about God. But there's a statement right in the early part of Romans that I think is so wonderful. I want to read it. That's Romans 1, and let's start with verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. Ken, can you add to that? Well, probably not, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about it a little bit. Quick, a little bit of background. The book of Romans was written from Corinth. Uh, Paul had had some problems with the Corinthian church after spending a year and a half there trying to build it up, and then he went to uh, went back home to Antioch and down to Jerusalem, and he comes back now to uh, Ephesus, where he spent three years. And during that time, some problems had arisen in, in Corinth, and he wrote four letters to the Corinthians. We've talked about those. And finally, he became so concerned about what was going in Corinth that he decided to walk around, all the way around, something like 600 miles, all the way around from Ephesus, all the way around to Corinth, and in the process of that, he got the good news that the Corinthians had accepted his message. And when he arrived there in the glow of that reunion with his old friends, uh, he sat down and was there over the winter, probably AD 57, 58, and wrote the books of Galatians and Romans. Not everyone would agree with that, but that's a pretty commonly accepted explanation of how these two books were written. Paul, of course, is writing with the assistance of a secretary or as the technicians, the technical people would say, an amanuensis. That's from the Greek. And so here we have Paul sitting down, not just writing a letter, although there's some characteristics of an ordinary letter here, but he's writing forward to the next major church he plans to visit, the church at Rome. Of course, he doesn't know what's coming up between his visit at Corinth and his future visit at Rome, but he had planned to go there fairly quickly. And he's basically explaining what he believes the gospel is all about. And so Norm's ver verses that he read to us are so appropriate. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Many modern translations say, like my good news says, I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power. And it the question which arises there is, why, what gives the gospel its power? Why is the gospel powerful? We possibly have enough to change your mind yes. about God, your, okay. your pic, change your picture of God. That okay. has uh, the ability to unite divinity within, with humanity once again. Yeah. Okay. And the gospel is the good news. Mm -hmm. That's the power. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. The part that people don't really recognize usually is that this argument, the issue in the book of Romans, is over the righteousness of God. Now we're going to point that out in great detail a little bit later, but people could raise a lot of questions over the righteousness of God. I mean, how has that ever been an issue? Who, who, who's arguing about the righteousness of God? I'd like to, just before we take off on that, where it says uh, it is the power of God for, to, for salvation, and uh, there are some translations that substitute the word healing 
the power of God for healing. I, th I think it was Wycliffe or one of those early ones did it that way. And if we recognize that uh, salvation is just a le legitimately uh, substitute the word he health or heal. Salvation is a long Latin word for healing. Yeah, that's what it is. The Greek word sozo means healing. It means salvation. We, we translate it salvation, but it means healing. Same word. No difference. So, um, in these few verses, uh, Romans 16 and 7, 1, 16 and 7, 17, I'm just going to read it from my Good News Bible to get another little flavor. I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. Now, unfortunately, my, and I'm, and I'm departing from the text a little, my friends who made my favorite translation here couldn't quite figure out why God's righteousness would be an argument. Who would be arguing about that? They, tri they, they changed the meaning of verse 17. For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself, not God's own righteousness. It is through faith from beginning to end as the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. And the last part of verse 17 is interesting there. It's a quote from, by Paul from the Old Testament taken from Habakkuk 2.4. And it would be good if we had time to go back there and look at the context. But the way Paul has worded that in Greek is very interesting. It could mean the, the man who is righteous because of his faith shall live. Or it could mean the man who is righteous shall live by his faith. So it can be taken either way. Uh, the by faith part in the middle can, can either live by his faith or righteous by his faith. You, you can take your choice. And it's very likely that Paul, clever as he was, intended it for, for it to be taken both ways. It wouldn't hurt either way, no. would it? And this verse, uh, verse 17 again, the righteousness of God, uh, righteousness of God is revealed. Uh, and that's what he's going to develop on and, and, and focus on what, why God is righteous, how he demonstrates that he is righteous, yeah. that God will always do the right thing in all circumstances. Which raises the next big question. Look at the next verse. If you were talking about the, if someone said, tell me the best news you know about God, the good news about God, what would you talk about first? God is love. He starts out with, with the wrath of God. Look at that, revealed. verse 18. God God's anger, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil, the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. In his day, there was a lot of rot going on and an awful lot of the ungodly were doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. And so he says, hey, there's a time coming when things are going to change and, and God's wrath is going to upset this wickedness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the message of God, the good news is look out, God's coming, He's going to get you if you're evil. Right? Well, does, if you have good news, isn't it supposed to counter any bad news? Yeah, you probably would think so. In contrast I mean, why, with what the popular why, fare is. Why would you call it good news if it wasn't good news, I mean, well, that's why would you even why put does he, good when he, when he says, I'm going to talk about the good news, then why did he start right off about talking about God's wrath? Well, Probably because they, they had another picture of God, and he's coming with a new picture that's good news. And the people of God who are waiting for God, who are generally speaking innocent people, God-fearing people, they're tired of seeing all of the wickedness. They're tired of waiting so to them, this is good news. The wicked are going to be destroyed. Not that we want to see them destroyed. We'd rather have them saved. But it's a joyful thing. The end is going to come. The wickedness is going to stop. People are going to stop robbing us, stop cheating us, stop slandering us. So this is a happy time. Because God's going to get them. <laughs> well, not necessarily because God's going to get them, but because that is going to cease. That wickedness will stop. Okay. Fear will I, stop. I think, you know, an exacting parent, a hard parent, has been around ever since time began, I mean, so to speak. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of what people would gravitate to as far as God goes. 
as far as concepts about God. And um, when Paul came up, he said, no, no, he's not like that. Mm -hmm. This is, I want to tell you what he's like, and this is good news. That's how I would see it anyway. It's interesting that in the next verse, he suggests that nobody has an excuse. Everybody has an opportunity, even in the things of nature, to learn about God, to learn the truth about God. But then he goes on and, and does something very interesting. Now, this is a message that's lost on people if they don't know at least a little bit about Greek. Paul loved to have long sentences. There, there's places in, the, in Paul's writings where a whole chapter is one sentence. A whole chapter is one sentence. And there's a long sentence here that goes from verse 18 all the way down to, I think it's the, um, I should look at the Greek. 24. It's, well, it's even beyond that. I think it's 28. Uh, somewhere down there. It's all one sentence. <laughs> so this, okay. what is the subject of that sentence? Who's acting? Who's doing what? But what does it say at the beginning of verse 18? Well, it's, it's people doing ugly things. But that's not the subject of the sentence. What's the subject of the sentence? 18. For God is manifest. Yeah. The subject of the sentence is God. He's the one that's doing something. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you go down there, and if it, you know, we, we can't tolerate those big, long sentences without you know, stopping and having a verb and a noun and so forth like this. So we, we chop the sentence up and we add the name God back in in a few spots and we do other things with it to make it read more spooly like we're used to in English. But if you realize that, you know, God is the subject of this whole thing, what does God do when he gets, quote, angry? Well, if you read verse 24. And 26 and 28. He says... Okay, goodbye. And so, look at verse 24. Romans 1, 24. And so God has given those people over. The Greek word is paradidomi. We'll keep, them, keep that in mind. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. So God has given those people over to do the filthy things their hearts desire. What does God do? He lets people exercise their own freedom. If they choose to go their own way, who stops them? Nobody. Question. Mm -hmm. um, the word uh, in Romans 4.25, he was delivered over to death, mm -hmm. referring to Jesus. Is that the same word, yes. word in Greek? We'll okay. come to that in a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, it was kind of interesting when you said that these people were allowed to exercise their freedom. Mm -hmm. You mean that's what they shouldn't have done? They should have stayed uh, well. without freedom? And stayed with him? No, no. No, no. <laughs> I'm saying... <laughs> they had they, the freedom uh, to stay with yeah. They had the freedom to do what they wanted to do, and that's what they did. Okay, yeah. Right. Okay. And if you read down to verse 26, because they do this, God has given them over to shameful passions. Again, paradidomy. He's given them over to shameful passions. And if you go to verse 28, because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, he has given them over to corrupt minds, so that and so forth. They paradidomy do again? Paradidomy again. Notice because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God. Okay? The true knowledge, God's righteousness. That's what we start out with back in verse 17, wasn't it? Yeah. God's righteousness. So, what, what's the thing with God's righteousness? Sometimes we call it the truth about God. Why is that so important? Well, he was accused of being a liar. Where was that? That was in the garden. Back in the Garden, garden of Eden. Eden. Yes, remember that God said, and we should look at those verses, back in Genesis um, 2, verse 17, what did God say? Genesis 2, verse 17, I really need to read from verse 15. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He told him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. That was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Okay. And 
What happened thereafter, soon thereafter? Gen uh, Genesis 3, the first five verses. Now the snake was the most cunning animal the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, Did God really tell you not to eat the fruit from any tree in the garden? We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake replied, That's not true. You will not die. God said that because he knows that what, when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad and so forth like that. So, what's the issue here? The issue is who's telling us the truth, isn't it? That's right. Is God telling us the truth or is Satan? Now, we obviously completely uh, uh, distort the, the question by automatically saying God versus the devil. And all, we have these preconceived ideas about what God does and what God says and what the devil says. But if we could say, who's telling us the truth, Sam or Henry? You know, I once took, went through the Bible with a, a good friend of mine, a, a fellow physician now. And he said, when he read through the first few books of Moses, and he said, all those things that said about God, I would start substituting. Every time I read, see the name God, I'd put in Henry in it. A little while later, I didn't like Henry at all. <laughs> so we need to ask ourselves, what, what's going on here? Do you think that, um, well, your question is, why is Paul bringing up the righteousness of God? Mm -hmm. Do you think that incident back in Eden is burning on everybody's mind at that time when he started talking about that? Well, or that's what we want to see. That's what we want to see. What, what is Paul, how Paul is going to follow through with this. Okay. okay. Um, and we can go, we can look at a few verses. Basically, Romans 1 says, you people, you Christians, who used to be, remember this book is written not to everybody in the city of Rome, because they're not going to hear it, but it's written to the Christians in Rome, and they're the ones who are going to hear this. Some of them used to be complete pagans, complete heathen. Others of them used to be Jews, strict Jews. And so he's, he's, he's speaking to a mixed audience here. Former pagans, former Jews. And in chapter 1, if you read it and digest it, after his introduction, Paul says, you people who used to be pagan, you were on a downward slide straight into you know, Never Never Land. And in chapter 2, he's going to say, you Jews, were actually worse. You strict legalists and so forth like this. And he really lays it on them. And then we're going to see what he concludes when we get to chapter 3. But we need to say a couple of things. Let me just read a note before we move on about the book of Romans. This is the, from the introduction to the book of Romans in the Message Bible. And it'll give you a nice uh, feel for the book of Romans. The event that split history into before and after, that would be B.C. and A.D. or B.C.E. and C.E. in some people's minds, and changed the world took place about 30 years before Paul wrote this letter. The event, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, took place in a remote corner of the extensive Roman Empire, the province of Judea. In Palestine, hardly anyone noticed Certainly no one in busy and powerful Rome. And when this letter arrived in Rome, hardly anyone read it. Certainly no one of influence. There was much to read in Rome. Imperial decrees, exquisite poetry, finely crafted moral philosophy, and much of it was world class. No question about it. And yet in no time, as such things go, this letter left all of those other writings in the dust. Paul's letter to the Romans had, has had a far larger impact on its readers than the volumes of all those Roman writers put together. The quick rise of this letter to a peak of influence is extraordinary, written as it was by an obscure Roman citizen without connections. But when we read it for ourselves, we begin to realize that it is the letter itself that is truly extraordinary, and that no obscurity in writer or readers could have kept it obscure for long. The letter to the Romans 
is a piece of exuberant and passionate thinking. This is the, this is the glorious life of the mind in, enlisted in the service of God. Paul takes the well-witnessed and devoutly believed fact of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth and thinks through its implications. Please notice that point. Paul says, and we're going to discover that Paul is the only one in Scripture who sits down and tries to explain to us why Jesus had to die. So he said, let's look at the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, and let's think about its implications. An incredibly important point. How does it happen that in the death and resurrection of Jesus, world history took a new direction? And at the same moment in the life of every man, woman, and child on the planet was that eternally affected? What is God up to? What does it mean that Jesus saves? What's behind all this and where is it going? These are the questions that drive Paul's thinking. Paul's mind is supple and capacious. He takes logic and argument, poetry and imagination, scripture and prayer, creation and history and experience and weaves them into this letter that has become the premier document of Christian theology. So that's what we're dealing with. Okay. So let's look at um, Romans 2 a little bit. Romans 2 is addressed to the Jewish, the formerly Jewish, now Jewish Christians. And he starts out, do you, my friend, pass judgment on others? You have no excuse at all, whoever you are. For when you uh, judge others and then do the same things which they do, you condemn yourself, and so forth. And he goes down. And I would like to, to stop for a moment on verse 4. Or perhaps you despise his great kindness, tolerance, and patience. Surely you know that God is kind because he is trying to lead you to repent. In what way does God's kindness lead people to repent? What's implied by that? It shows that he's constantly forgiving us. He's constantly trying to guide us. He's constantly trying to save us. So yes, he's like a father who keeps scolding us and keeps telling us what to do, but we also see the kind side of him. Mm -hmm. when, when you get a concept of who God was before he came to earth, monarch of the universe, creator of it all, then comes down here where he's got a problem and gives everything that heaven has to offer in his own sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You get a, a, a handle on that, repentance kind of comes with it. What, what does repentance mean? Does it mean that we become small? No, no. All of a sudden we need to, that we see this great thing happening and all of a sudden we feel like, oh man, this is so great. No. I, Repentance it, really means you change your mind. You change your mind. You're sorry for what happened. Okay, so when you repent to God, mm -hmm. what are you doing? I mean, are you talking? Well, you can. You, you can talk out loud. Is you that, don't have to. So when you repent, Aren't you, how do you show that you changed your mind? You just well, God you tell him, I used out. to think, I used to think that I could do this, that, and the other thing, and that this would give me great benefit. But now I found out it doesn't, and I think we need to go this way now. Yes. So, and God will guide you. It's not only, it's not only saying you're sorry, but you're, you're coming up with a, a new way of looking at yeah, things. I, I think you give up on self. And depend on him. Well, well this is general. This is this is important because what we have discovered, and, and we don't have time to discuss all of Christian theology, which you could in the Book of Romans. <laughs> but many, many church groups down through history have focused on how we deal with our past sins. What do you have to do? And and so the focus tends to be on on forgiveness. Um, sometimes we use long Latin words to talk about that process, things like justification and so forth. Uh, we don't need long Latin words, really. Um, we're, we're, we're looking at that. We're seeing what God has done, what God wants us to do. Um, so if God's kindness 
is out there and we understand it, we recognize what kind of person he is, and we respond to that, we change our mind. And that's repentance. And forgiveness is, a, I mean, the, the classic example of forgiveness is Jesus. He's there with his arms spread out and they're nailing him to the cross. And what does he say? Forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Did they ask for forgiveness? No. No. Did they have any, even want forgiveness? They didn't think there was anything they needed forgiveness for, right? Jesus forgave them before they even asked or even thought about it. So what does that tell us about God? This is what we're talking about in Romans 2. For, personified. Yeah. He's, forgiveness is not any problem at all with God. So what is the issue with God? If it's not taking care of our past sins, what is it? The issue of God. He wants is, to heal you. He wants to heal you, so you do what? Have Take instruction. Yeah, L you, 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 you live a healthier, better life in the future. Yeah, that's, that's what God... God says, if you forget about the past, I'll forget about the past. Let's see if we can do better in the future. But um, how do you know if you're going to do better in the future? I mean, well, all you're doing is just saying, let's take another shot at it? Well, that depends on your relationship with God. Now, he says, see, if you give him the time, if you're willing to spend your time with Bible study and prayer and doing those kinds of things... God says, that gives me a chance to, do, to, to actually work in your brain, to actually make a difference, to see, to see new ideas and new approaches and so forth like that, and that will change you. Not, not you change yourself. God will work in the Holy Spirit, will work in your mind as you give him opportunity. That's what makes a difference. And um, Paul's going to talk about that very significantly when we come to chapter 3, in just a moment. He's, at the end of chapter 2, he talks about the law. He talks about how Jews were so strict on the law. and they, Why were they so strict with the law? What did they think it was going to do for them? Save them. Yeah, they believed that by keeping the law, they were going to be saved. Is there any place in the Bible that says that by keeping the law, you'll be saved? It is true, but depends what... You, the meaning you get out of that. Okay, what, what is the meaning you get out of it? The meaning? The meaning is it's valuable to you. I guess it, it could be true it. if you kept it, but yeah. we were told by Jesus that basically it's impossible for yeah. us to keep it because even if you thought of doing something or if you broke one, you broke all of it, mm -hmm. even if the Lord forgave us daily. Mm -hmm. So we need Jesus. We need that salvation. Paul is going to tell us in chapter 3 when we get there that there's nothing wrong with the law. Where's the, where's the problem? We just can't do it. We can't keep the law. We cannot earn salvation by keeping the law. We just fail. Um, Benjamin Franklin is famous for the, his, his, I think it was 13 things he was going to do. He was going to work on 13 things, and the last one was humility. And he said, I became so proud that I was so humble I just couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's the problem we, ha we sinners have with uh, trying to do something by, try to accomplish something by keeping the law. We just can't do it. That's where the problem is. So Paul is going to offer a, suge a suggestion, some very clear guidelines about where we need to go next and how all this should wrap together. And that's what we'll talk about when we come back. So don't go away.
Welcome back. We, we're turning now to Romans, the third chapter, and it starts out with verses that a lot of people apparently have ignored. Do the Jews then have any advantage over the Gentiles? Or is there any value in being circumcised? Because that's, of course, the Jews would say the reason we're special is because we're circumcised, we do, we follow the rules, etc. Much indeed in every way, Paul says. Now, you might have been surprised that Paul would say that. In the first place, now, what about Paul? Was Paul a, a faithful Jew? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he had been raised as a Pharisee of the Pharisees, right? And been circumcised on the eighth day and all those things, just as Jesus was. But, when if, but what if some of them, that is the Jews, um, were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Now, what was the question we had from, birth, from chapter 1? Even from Genesis 1, I mean 2 and 3? Who's telling us the truth, right? Who can be trusted? And what does he ask here? Does that mean that God will not be faithful or can be trusted? See, there's the question right there, straight out of Genesis. Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true even though all human beings are liars. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. What? God on trial? Now, surely that doesn't happen. How could God be on trial? What's he talking about? Nobody sure? Well, if he's this, been this, accused, how is he going to be vindicated? Okay. Somebody has to make that decision. Okay. So is there a, is there a court somewhere that's over, over, up even higher above God and he takes his case to the court? Nope. No? No, he, he's, he's interacting with his creation. Uh -huh. So he's, gonna, he's going to make his case to his creation. Okay. And how does he do that? Well, let's take a human example, and then we'll, we'll, we'll look at this. We all know that when it comes time for a new Supreme Court judge to be appointed by the president, there's a huge debate and argument back and forth and so forth. What, what, why is that? Why is there such an issue about appointing a new Supreme Court judge? Well, to see if what his philosophy is about, and how okay. he'll probably judge. Okay. What's important to him, what's not important. Okay. Things like that. Okay. What he's done in the past. So when a new Supreme Court judge is appointed, what we want to know is how has he judged in the past, right? To get an idea of what their particular leanings are, their ways of thinking, and so forth like this. Um, could that kind of situation apply to God? How he's, how he's treated people in the past? What he's done in the past? Does that teach us anything about him? Yeah, I mean, there was a time when he kind of wiped out a whole bunch, except for a few riding around in a boat. Yes. Was he just? Was he honest? Was he true? Was he true? Was that a good? Was that a fair thing to do? I think that when we look back on that, we'll see that they were given chance after chance, year after year, decade after decade, century after century. So the answer would be yes. When we when we're uh, privy to all of the knowledge. Well, think think of all the things that happen in the Old Testament that could raise questions about God's fairness. We've just mentioned the flood. What about the killing of all the firstborn in Egypt? What about all the plagues in Egypt, all the other plagues in Egypt? What about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? The earth opened up and swallowed them, just like that. What about the stoning of Achan and his family? I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uzzah tried to reach out and steady the ark, and he's struck dead by God. I mean, you could make a case that there are some pretty scary things that God seemed to do in the Old Testament. Seems to be that there was precedent before most of those things. For example, don't go near the ark. Mm -hmm. Don't touch it. Mm -hmm. that, that was out there. Don't, 
don't do this, don't do that, and they do it anyways, and they wound up in, in slavery in Egypt. Don't worship other gods, don't worship the sun god. The Egyptians did all of that. So it's pretty exacting. Well, you know, either, either there is a god and you follow his way, and if you don't, there are repercussions. Uh, I'm, I have to admit right now, I'm driving my car. I had a flat tire recently, and I haven't fixed the spare yet. That's rather foolish. Mm -hmm. And if I get a flat tire, I'm surely not going to be able to complain to somebody else that I got a flat tire and now I don't have a spare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's my responsibility to fix that or at least have it done or follow a good common sense code on that. And hopefully I will <laughs> soon. Okay. But let's come back to the verse here. Is there a case, a time when God is actually taken his case into court? How does that happen? Well, in one way, you know, everybody takes God into court for himself mm -hmm. and to figure out whether or not I want him to be my personal God or not. Yeah. And what kind of God he is yes. and what, what you're going to believe in. So personally, that's happening. Mm -hmm. And then, then I guess you can look at it as a overall thing, what everybody's doing. Collectively. Uh, collectively, you know, as far as what God is, they're, they're judging him in that angle too. So, Do we have any evidence from the Old Testament that God is absolutely precisely square on when he judges people? Think of any examples. Well, a lot of it we have to take by faith. Yeah, but there's but a, are you talking about? There's a very clear example from the Old Testament, the whole book of Job. What happens in the book of Job? Now, we, that's not our study for tonight, but in Job 1, verse 8, um, and really going down to verse, um, well, basically verse 8, God said Job was a righteous and a faithful man. And, and, and Satan came and said, well, that's because you just, you treat him so special, you take care of him, you do all this kind of stuff. And God says, okay, take away everything. Then in chapter 2, he says, well, but if, you know, if you let me attack Job himself, he'll go he'll, up. Uh, and God says, no, he won't. He, uh, like I said before, he's a faithful and upright, a righteous man. He will stay that way. And then the whole book goes on and talks about Job talking and his enemies come and Every, the devil tries every conceivable way he can imagine to break Job down. And what's the conclusion? When you come over to chapter 42, verses 7 and 8, you discover something very interesting. It says, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, now this is one of Job's friends who came, and by the way, if you go back, you, you really need to, to, to know where Eliphaz came from. If you go back to Job 4, the devil himself appeared to, uh, uh, to Eliphaz and said, nobody is righteous in the sight of God. There's no way that Job can be righteous. You know, God does, God's judgment is faulty if he says that, that Job can be righteous. He even finds fault with his angels. He even finds fault with his angel, angels in, in, in Job 4, as I said. Well, the conclusion is, God says, I am angry with you, Eliphaz, and your two friends, because you did not speak the truth about me the way my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls, etc., and then drop down to the end of verse 8. Um, I will not disgrace you the way you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did, that is, as, as Job did. So, what does that tell us about the whole issue about telling the truth about God and whether God can be taken into court, etc. It says God don't make, as someone used to say, God don't make no mistakes, right? Yeah. God's just judgment. So, does, has God demonstrated that adequately to our satisfaction? Is that if, if we look at Job mm -hmm. and conclude that God can look at him in a man's heart, and know what is true, and know what his response will be in the future, mm -hmm. then has he been in court? Is that the court? It was proved. Other people could see. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job didn't give in. Mm -hmm. And God said, see, I told you so. Mm -hmm. 
Is that the is that is that the end of the court case? Well, not the end of the court case, but it's certainly a, a very powerful round of, of of the situation because God says, "Here's what I say," and the devil says, "That can't be true." And who, who who's told us the truth? God told the truth, and the devil was was wrong. And there's lots of other cases. The whole Old Testament is full of lots of examples of things like that. Well, Romans 3 goes on, since that's what we're talking about today. And it says, and, and Paul just says, starting with verse 9 all the way down to 23, he says, the truth is that all of us have been a bunch of sinners. And he, he, he proves that for, by quoting a bunch of verses from the Old Testament. There's no question about it. He ends up with Romans 3.23, a famous verse that many of us have memorized. Uh, and I'll read it from my Good News translation. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. So, you people who used to be heathen and now are Christians, are you sinners? Yep. Are you far away from God's saving grace? Yes. You people who are Jew, used to be Jews, thought that you could earn salvation by either that you, got, you deserve salvation just because you were descended from Abraham, or you could earn salvation by keeping the law. What's your condition? Same song. Sinners, same just like everybody else. In Romans 3, he just nails it down. We are all sinners. We are all sinners. We are all sinners. But then he says, okay, now let's talk about the solution. And what is the solution? Well, look at Romans 3, 25 and 26. And this ver these two verses have probably had more variations in translation than, than any two other two verses in the Bible, maybe. I will read it from my Good News translation. God offered him, that of course is talking about Jesus from the previous verse, God offered him so that by his blood, that's a, that's a code word in the Bible and Paul's writings especially for talking about his death, his sacrificial death, by his blood he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this in order to... Now, what is God accomplishing? What's God trying to accomplish through all of this? Demonstrate His righteousness. To demonstrate His righteousness. Okay? In, in the past, He was patient and overlooked people's sins, but in the present time, He deals with His sins in order to demonstrate His righteousness. In this way, God shows that He Himself is righteous, and that He puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. You, that last word shows, shows that he himself is righteous. You could say that he demonstrated. Yeah. So three, what do we have? Time. We have three times Paul says God has demonstrated his own righteousness. And then it's, oh, oh, by the way, he also takes care of people who have faith in him. But that's not the main point. Why are we so determined to make Romans all about what God does for you and me? It's about God himself. If it's and a God's law of own. human nature that you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire, God has a duty as a parent to teach his kids. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, p religions have mm -hmm. mucked it up. So, <laughs> so you're saying that he's pointing to God and showing his righteousness, mm -hmm. and that is kind of giving us the, the basis for faith, because what we have faith in is the person of righteousness. Okay. And so, since we have that faith, we get the benefit of that righteousness. So now remember, we, we, we read the note, and, and Paul is trying to do this. Think about the implications. Paul said, if you think about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, what are you going to learn? The truth about God. The truth about God. Which tells us what? Well, that's, that's what you're supposed to be thinking about when you read the book of Romans. Let's think about that. That he loves us and values us. Okay. That's why he brought this whole thing. Okay, there are, there are lots and lots of different explanations of why Jesus had to die. And we don't have time to go through the details, but they fall largely into three big categories. Uh, let's see if we can review those three very quickly. Some people would say, you know, what Jesus did was 
assuage God's wrath. God is angry with us because we, we have sinned, and now Jesus has, has paid the price, and now I'm okay. Okay? Does that sound like a good plan? Sounds good, right? It's easy to say that. It's easy to explain. And if you perceive yourself as a sinner mm -hmm. and can be forgiven by that model, mm -hmm. you're probably happy. Okay. One of the earliest variations of that was called the ransom theory. And let's just look at that for just a moment. And there are verses in the Bible which talk about being redeemed. That's the same word as ransom. Um, in ancient times, uh, there were well, very wealthy families and there were a lot of people who were slaves. And there was a temptation for people to kidnap a child of a wealthy family, hold him for ransom, and then say, if you give me enough money to buy my freedom, I'll give you your kid back. Okay? And so the early, some of the early Christian theologians said, well, that's a little, bit about, a little bit like what God and the devil have done. By sinning, we sell ourselves into the hands of Satan. Now, now we belong to him. We're in slavery to Satan. So God comes along and he says, okay, Satan, I'll sell you the soul of Jesus, the person of Jesus, the actual body of Jesus. I'll give you that in exchange for all the wicked people. And the devil says, well, what I've always wanted to be in the, was to be in the place of Christ, to be in the place of God. I can become God. I can be equal with God. I mean, what else could I ask for? I'll gain everything if I'm just willing to give up all these sinners. And why do I want all these sinners anyway? They don't do me any good. So he exchanges all sinners for Jesus. What he doesn't realize is that because Jesus is divine, he can't hold on to him. So Jesus escapes from, from Satan, and thus God wins the great controversy by deceiving the devil. How does that sound to you? The, the Tricking the devil. Going against the deal, too, if you ask me. Well, no. He didn't. He, God didn't well, say anything. If, if Not he, very satisfying, let's just yeah. put it that way. <laughs> well, that was, a, that was a major explanation of why Jesus had to die for years and years, hundreds of years. I think they've improved on that. Okay. Well, another theory is that, and this came along as, as law courts became more common and people began to, to think about the issues and so forth, and the idea came, well, what's happened is we have, we, we have violated the law. We, we are condemned as sinners. So what happens? God must, have, must find some way to pay our debt, to, to deal with that, that problem. How, how would he do that? Well, he has to meet the requirements of the law. And our Reformation friends who, who started the Protestant Reformation were very, very concerned about dealing with our guilt and so forth and talking about how we're all guilty because Adam sinned, etc. So dealing with that guilt, they said, no, something, someone has to pay the price. God's demanded. God says, if you sin, you will die, and that's a, there's a price to be paid, so now someone has to pay. So what happens? God says, well, if you pay the price, you'll be dead a long time. But if I come, I live a perfect life, a sinless life, and then die, I can pay the price and redeem you. So this, this came to have law court forensic sort of implications. And this is a common explanation that's given even today for what exactly happened. What are the pros and cons of that? Well, that assumes that the primary issue is an action that broke the law. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that if you can get that law satisfied, everything's okay. But in reality, there was something very disastrous that went on went before they ever broke the law. Mm -hmm. When they decided to move their faith and love to the creature in the tree. Mm -hmm. And they broke that relationship. They, they, they decided to trust in that. So the broken relationship really preceded the actual eating of the fruit. How, does, how would that, the, that model solve the broken relationship problem? Well, and more than that, let's think about this. 
if you take either one of those two first models, you've got a powerful God up there somewhere who's making demands, see? And he's got to, he's got to be paid and so forth. You've got to do something to try to assuage his anger or whatever. And so you, you pay the price and you still hope that things are going to be all right because what do you, what's going to happen now if you, if, you, if you don't, if everything doesn't work out all right? You're, you're in trouble again, right? Well, another possibility is this, that when we sinned, we broke that relationship, as you suggested, that w and, and we've, we've suffered terrible consequences. What can be done about this? Jesus came and showed us the kind of life, lived the kind of life that we should live. And then and we can look at that life, we can see how it worked out, we can see how he related to sinners, we can see the implications, we can see how people reacted with him, all that through the Gospels. And then he said, okay, now let me die the death of sinners. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21, uh, some other places, uh, I like the comments made by Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 25, paragraph 2. She says, he died the death that we deserve so that we can live the life that he deserved. And so he comes and he dies and he says, okay, look at, watch, watch me, see what happens. Jesus actually died without going into a lot of detail. Jesus actually on the cross did not die of crucifixion. He did not die of blood loss. He did not die of the nails in his hands. He died of sin. God had said back in the beginning, if you sin, you will die. He had not, the people who died up to that point had died of all kinds of other things. But this is the first time a human being had actually died of sin. And then, of course, he rose on Sunday morning, proving that he was God. But we now can look at the life and death of Jesus and we can say, which do we choose? Do we choose to live a life the way he lived it? Or do we choose to die the way he died? That's the choice. What, what grants a person to live the life that he deserves? What grants it? What do you mean by grants it? I mean, God... That's what I said. What grants it? Uh, what, what, what says, okay, you can do it now? Well, what, what actually happens is this. God says, look at the example. Follow it as close as you can. That's what, I've, that's what I'm showing you. Look at the Gospels. Look at Jesus. In fact... Look at the actions of Jesus. The New Testament is going to tell us, look at the actions of Jesus all the way through. Corinthians says the same Jesus who lived in the Gospels was the God of the Old Testament. When Adam and Eve sinned, mm -hmm. that relationship was broken. Mm -hmm. Their contact with divinity had been broken. Mm -hmm. And there was no way that they could improve on their situation. It wasn't until Jesus came and proved that humanity, again associated with divinity, mm -hmm. could accomplish what, what Adam was asked to do. And in doing that, he has shown that if humanity once again is connected to divinity, everything can be all right. And he has said, if you will put your faith and love back in me, if you will choose me, by faith, dedicate your life to me. I'll let my divinity take care of your humanity and everything will be okay. Yes. Uh, and again, remember, it's not we're the ones who do the changing. God comes into our lives. He's the one that do, does the changing. Yes. We exercise the faith. It's God who does the, and now I'm using long Latin terms, the justifying, the sanctifying, the salvation, etc. Those are Latin terms. All we need to know is how to trust God. But there was a decision mm -hmm. to abandon God and not trust Him and trust the creature yep. in the tree. Yep. That was a decision that they made. And on the basis of what Jesus did through His life and on the cross, we can make the decision, I want trust something, I, to trust Him again. Do we see in the life of Jesus something that we want to emulate? Yeah. Something that we want to copy? Absolutely, yes. If we see something we want to copy, then that's the question, that's the answer, and God says, let me help you, because that's the goal, that's the, that's the 
the, the image that we want to practice. And I'll empty all heaven to help yep. you do it. Exactly. Now, I'm going to take just a moment and ask a question which needs to be asked. It was asked a thousand years ago in a book by Anselm. Um, people, you know, talk about how God is going to, you know, the innocent died and the innocent died for us and he saves us because he's innocent and so forth. And God says, okay, I'll accept the death of Jesus in place of all these wicked people. And Anselm raised this question, which I think we still need to, to, to struggle with. If God could only save sinners by condemning the innocent, how are we to think of him? I'm sorry, is he truly omnipotent? How can we say God is omnipotent if he can't save us until an innocent person dies? If, on the other hand, he could, he could save us, but he's not willing to do so, how are we to think of him as wise and just? What justice could there possibly be in accepting the death of the most innocent man who ever lived in place of the guilty? No human legal system would accept that, so how can God do such a thing? And that's a question that people who take the forensic approach to uh, the plan of salvation haven't been able to deal with in a thousand years. And we need to ask ourselves, what is going on here? Is this a real transformation? Is it a legal change? What is God asking from us? And God is simply saying, do you look at the life of Jesus? Look at everything God did in the Old Testament. Do you think that's enough basis for trusting me? Yeah. If you think that's enough basis for trusting me, then we're on the same page. Let's move forward. I can make the changes in your thinking over a period of time. I can make the changes in your thinking. I can make the changes in your ways of understanding. I can give you the clear picture of me so that we can develop that trusting faith relationship once again, what, which really matters. That's what really matters. And by the way, Paul says in Acts 16, 31, is the only requirement for salvation. We trust God. He takes care of the rest. Now, that's not a simple thing. Trusting God, it takes some doing on our part, and we have to struggle to try to follow his guidance, but he can do it. Think about that. We'll talk more about it in the rest of Romans next week. See you then.